be advised that the views and opinions of the hosts and guests do not reflect those of the station. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Philippines Uncut. I'm your host, Buddy Kunana. Now, in this show, we talk about everything under the sun, and tonight's show is about one a topic of, this, of high national importance. Now, for a couple of weeks, we've been witness to uh, the rising tensions in the southern Philippines over the Sultan of Sulu's claim to Sabah, which currently lies in Malaysian territory, and the actions of his armed followers in that area. Now, this has undoubtedly and, uh, and, and uh, not, not, not surprisingly rankled Philippine-Malaysian ties. And uh, at present, we are all waiting in bait and anticipation of the final outcome of this messy affair. And joining us to talk about Saba and human rights is uh, Mr. Ray Paolo Santiago, attorney Ray Paolo Santiago, and he's the executive director of the Ateneo Human Rights Center. Attorney Santiago, welcome to Philippines Uncut. Thank you, buddy. Good evening, everyone. Yes, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here because uh, actually, for the longest time, I've always wanted to talk about the Ateneo Human Rights Center, and I think uh, it's a very interesting organization, and hopefully tonight we can illuminate the audience about what you guys are doing at the AHRC. Okay. The Ateneo Human Rights Center is a university-based uh, NGO. Uh, from the name itself, it's based in the Ateneo, Ateneo. Law School. Uh, it was established in 1987, so just right after the EDSA revolution, um, the many Athenians at the time at the law school thought of how can we try to help in changing things from the way it was before. So they, they decided that the way is through human rights. So they uh, established the Human Rights Center based in the law school so that uh, we could promote a human rights approach through law. Now, um, Attorney Chichago, let's talk about human rights. Define human rights. Internationally, there's really no definition for human rights. Uh, they would say you would know it because we all have it. It's inherent in all of us. Uh, it's 
equal to everyone, whether you're young, old, you have human rights. Um, there, there are different rights when you talk about human rights, collectively human rights, but um, you can break it down to you have political rights, you have uh, uh, civil rights, economic rights, social rights, cultural rights, but in order to fully enjoy human rights, you must have all of these or you must have access to all of these because they are interrelated yes. and interdependent. Yes. So, for example, they say that uh, uh, even if you have money but you cannot speak your mind, you are still deprived because there's no freedom of expression, expression. or opinion. And even those in many, uh, for many Filipinos, we have a lot of freedom of expression, freedom of opinion. We rally to the streets, but many of them rally because <laughs> they have no food to eat. Yeah. So that's a violation of their economic rights. Yeah, interesting you should mention that because um, that video we saw was a, actually it was an amateur video and was prepared mm -hmm. by a group of students for the International Day of Human Rights, yes. which is December 10th mm -hmm. every year. And uh, it, it said there, I mean, uh, it detailed freedom of expression, freedom mm -hmm. to play, freedom to, uh, I mean, access to for food, for security, mm -hmm. uh, shelter. So everything you mentioned, yes. economic, uh, political, mm -hmm. Yes, because a bit of history is that uh, you know, right after World War II, after the UN was established, they uh, gathered all countries, member states of UN, and decided to come up with what is now the Universal Declaration of Human Rights way back in uh, December 10, 1948. And what is the relevance of this declaration? This declaration um, in international law Everyone, all lawyers would know that a declaration is non-binding. But politically, a declaration is uh, a state saying that, yes, we recognize that these are the rights of people mm -hmm. that we should respect. Mm -hmm. And since rights are inherent in all of us, it has to be emphasized that when the states recognize that you and I have this, the next step, if they are really sincere, is how do we promote, how do we protect, how do we respect these rights. Oh, nice. So that's why internationally they say, okay, these are, we recognize that these are human rights, but when you go home to your domestic and individual countries, you would see its level of promotion and protection based on the law, and not only on the law, based on the implementation of the law. So that's where the real meat comes in. Attorney Santiago, how did you get involved in uh, human rights? How did you get involved in this advocacy? Uh, <laughs> it's a funny story because when <laughs> I was in uh, college, I always thought that uh, I wanted to be in the military. Oh, wow. I was, uh, <laughs> I was very much involved in our reserve, ROTC. Uh, in ROTC. I was a cadet officer, uh, part of the UP Vanguard. Wow. <laughs> and uh, when I went to uh, law school, I had my... Uh, not at UP, not at not, UP. Not at UP, at but Ateneo. in uh, Ateneo this okay. time. I, uh, choice. Yes, <laughs> and then uh, this time, I had my internship with the Ateneo Human Rights Center. And uh, I can say now that it's really life-changing because uh, I was exposed to the different marginalized and vulnerable groups. And I felt that we learned the law and many lawyers try to learn the law because it would benefit us. Yes, it yes. would benefit uh, lawyers um, professionally and financially. But at the same time, you see that many people actually can't access the law because they can't afford lawyers. And many people become marginalized. They are already vulnerable, such as children, okay. indigenous peoples, and yet they have no access to the law because no one is taking their cause. So this is how I really got entangled with uh, the Ateneo Human Rights Center. And you've been uh, with and the center since uh, I've been with the center since graduation. Uh, as an intern yeah. since uh, uh, my, s uh, well, in between second and third year of law school. And right after taking the bar, I immediately joined the wow. Human Rights Center. Wow, bravo, uh, very <laughs> good. Now, l let's talk about the center. What is the mission and vision? And, and wh what exactly does the center do? Okay, the vision is very straightforward, a just and humane society. And uh, our mission is to develop this just and humane society. Uh, you would have to have institutions 
that not that are not only promoting the rule of law, but a, having a human rights orientation. Okay, when we say human rights orientation, uh, we have different treaties, okay. international human rights conventions that uh, already expounds what are the different rights of uh, people in different classes, uh, different groups. Okay. Okay? So we want this ingrained through a human rights approach if, it, if we're talking about institutions because uh, I guess you know that many people would always say we have to follow the law, the rule of law. But sometimes the law itself is the one which is oppressive. So in that way, part of what we want to push is amending or changing laws that are actually against human rights oh, or okay. having laws that are human rights oriented so that it would benefit everyone once it is properly implemented. Uh, another way of doing this is also through uh, encouraging law students and lawyers later on that they might want to engage in what we call alternative lawyering practice. We just simply call it alternative because the mainstream at the moment are those who litigate for financial gain, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. those who join corporations. Yeah, but yeah. alternative is being a lawyer for the marginalized and vulnerable groups. So of course we have to earn a living because uh, we, have to eat too, no? we, we also <laughs> have rights, <laughs> uh, we also have uh, yeah. mouths to feed. <laughs> but it's not excessive living. I mean, it's giving access also to different groups who otherwise might not be able to access the law. And lawyers can do this part time, right? I mean, you could have no, lawyers you can do, can do, do this part time. It's not, you don't have to do it full time. You can yes. contribute and, uh, in your and own actually, way. Actually, we've been telling our interns at the at the law school, um, well, not only in Ateneo, but uh, those other in interns all over the Philippines who have been joining the program, that. Being al an alternative lawyer does not always mean that you have to be with an NGO. You know, you have you can have this kind of mindset in government. That would be very good because Absolutely. you'll be part of the, the mechanism. System. You're part of the system. That you would can be change it from within. Yes, right? you could be. Uh, uh, you could have this mindset in private practice. For example, if I am with a private uh, law firm, and I know that uh, you know that my the practice of my firm is not <laughs> how well we know the law, but how well do we know the, the judge, then maybe you could also help influence changing that kind of position to give fairness yeah, to yeah. causes of other people as well. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to change, actually, the mindset here. Okay. Now, now okay, let's talk about uh, practical, um, uh, let's say, activities, real activities of, of the a a AHRC. Wh what do you guys do exactly? What kind of programs? We talk about changing from within, changing the mindset and all that, but what kind of programs do you carry out to our do this? Our flagship program right now is our internship program. Um, we, Since we're based in the law school and we want to change mindset of uh, law students uh, who we know would become future lawyers, uh, the internship program aims to serve the marginalized and poor people, uh, vulnerable groups, by volunteering, uh, these interns volunteering their time, even resources, in helping out in uh, different cases and advocacies. Okay. Now, this uh, internship program has also been uh, replicated, and we're, we're trying to convince other law schools all over the Philippines. Have you been successful? How successful have you been? In, in some law schools, because uh, the challenge here actually is to, uh, is to convince university officials or uh, uh, law schools that it's worthwhile to, to have spend money for a this. legal aid program at the very least yeah. or a human rights center. Because some law schools, and you can't blame them, like in the provinces, they don't have much resources, they would say, Course, you know, course. the business of our law school is to produce lawyers. lawyers. Yeah. And if this will actually distract them. Divert resources away. Yes. Then uh, we might not be uh, effective mm. I with that, mm. with their very limited resources. Uh, but in reality, um, if we were telling many law schools that uh, if, if you have a legal aid program, for example, then the experience is uh, very direct. 
because in many communities, especially in provinces mm -hmm. uh, where there are lesser lawyers, this would be the best linkage uh, between the grassroots mm -hmm. and uh, a legal institution mm -hmm. that would help them access justice. We've been uh, successful in uh, uh, con on con convincing uh, some law schools, like for example in uh, Xavier University in, uh, in Cagayan, Cagayan de Oro, yeah. uh, Ateneo de Davao. Uh, you might think that only Jesuit <laughs> institutions. <laughs> I was going to say that. Uh, <laughs> in <laughs> University of San Carlos in oh, okay, Cebu. Cebu. Uh, in uh, le in also Legaz Catholic, also Catholic le uh, school, no? Well, this one is not Catholic. It's uh, actually a Muslim school in Western Mindanao State University. Ah, okay. They have okay. a legal aid office is recently established. Uh, where else? In in uh, Legazpi City, also Aquinas University. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so these are some of the law schools who we were able to convince. And uh, every summer and uh, semester break of the law school, we would be inviting students to join the program. Yes, yes. And for those coming from uh, different law schools, not from Ateneo de, de Manila, uh, we encourage these students to convince also their universities and law schools to uh, set up this kind of program. So your, your activities are really focused on the internship, this in internship program, and, and fomenting this in other uh, law schools around the country. This is really what your main focus is That's one. On. That's the flagship. Okay, the flagship. Because, because of this internship program within Ateneo de Manila, in yeah. uh, the law school, uh, this led to the establishment of other programs and desks. For example, our Child Rights Desk. Its acronym is actually ACAP. To embrace, to embrace sure. but uh, it's adikain para sa karapatang pambata. Okay, so this desk was actually a product of interns who wanted to do work for children. And uh, one of the things that uh, in in the recent past that we have been pushed, uh, that we have pushed for, is the development of a ju the Juvenile Justice Welfare Act. Uh, before uh, a minor. Uh, who is above nine years old, who is at least nine years old, can be held criminally liable. Now, studies have shown uh, that the Filipino uh, minor psyche is that maturity sets in after the age of uh, 15. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, we were able to convince our legislators then that the minimum age of cri criminal responsibility should be 15. What does that mean? If you are below... 15 years old, then you are free from any criminal liability. You can be prosecuted. You cannot be prosecuted. Okay. If you are from 15, uh, but not yet the age of majority, and you acted with discernment, meaning you already know what you're doing, yeah. then you can be made criminally liable. Okay? But it doesn't mean that they can go scot-free yeah. for, for children who are not criminally liable. There is, of course, the civil liability, uh, they should be properly supervised by their parents. Mm -hmm. And in the law, there is what you call diversion programs. Diversion means you divert them from jails, but to a program that will rehabilitate them. Yes, yes. So um, right now, we're concentrating, sad to say, we're concentrating on opposing moves to bring down that 15, eight, 15 years old age of uh, uh, minimum criminal responsibility to 12. There are moves right now to bring it down to 12 simply because of poor implementation of the law. Do you think that it will happen? It, it will actually be moved down to 12 years old? I hope not, but there so has been a lot a, of... There's uh, a good chance it could be. There, there's a good chance. I'm not mm. encouraging it, but mm. there is simply because many legislators are not that open-minded to think that the problem really here is implementation of the law. Yeah. Now, Attorney Santiago, um, you know, so much to talk about with the AHRC, but uh, our topic tonight is actually um, the human rights and the Sabah uh, mm -hmm. issue. And, uh, you know, very hot uh, issue these days. Mm -hmm. And I understand that you guys came out with a semi-controversial statement that was somehow, uh, you know, I mean, it was not taken kindly by, by the palace. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand you have a copy of the statement. Would you like mm -hmm. to read it? Okay. Yes. In recent weeks, the Sultanate of Sulu 
headed by Sultan Jamalul Kiram III and a group of Tausugs forming part of the Royal Army of Sulu went to the town of Lahaddatu in Sabah. They asked that the Sultanate receive royalties commensurate to Sabah's economic growth and that they be allowed to peacefully settle there, which they consider their homeland. However, in a press conference held on February 26, 2013, President Benigno Aquino III appealed to Sultan Kiram and his supporters to withdraw from Sabah and peacefully end their standoff. He, unfortunately, referred to their cause as a hopeless cause. Further, the president threatened them with prosecution by issuing a stern warning that if they choose not to cooperate, they will face the full force of the law. The Ateneo Human Rights Center expresses its deep concern on what transpired in Lahat Datu Sabah, which escalated into violence resulting in the death of a number of our Muslim countrymen, women. The AHRC likewise expresses its disappointment on the government's treatment of the problem. From its public demeanor and dismissive statements, it has exhibited an insensitivity to the root cause of the incident and an impaired knowledge of the historical, cultural, political, and personal dimensions of the aspirations of our Tausug brothers and sisters in relation to Saba. While the government may have expressed its nonconformity to the manner by which the claim was pursued, it should have, in the same breath, sympathized and expressed its solidarity with the noble cause and territorial objectives of our Muslim countrymen and women. Indeed, the government may have unduly alienated citizens who have here, he, hither hereto exhibited loyalty to the Philippines. While not condoning any form of violence, the Philippine government should demonstrate that the interests of our Filipino Muslim brothers and sisters involved are its paramount concern. And it, ha it, has, it has not derogated from its responsibility to protect their human rights. Therefore, we call on President Benigno Aquino III to take the appropriate actions to achieve an amicable settlement on the issues surrounding the turmoil in Sabah. Also, we urge the government to extend all the possible assistance to our brothers and sisters, Muslims, involved in this tragic event. Moreover, we implore the President to get the possible counsel in relation to this recent tragedy. The thre threats made by our own Department of Justice towards the Sultan and the members of the Sultanate of Sulu do not solve the problem. President Aquino should assure them that the government will take the matter seriously in order to arrive at a peaceful solution. The Philippine government should also guarantee the Sultanate of Sulu that it continues to honor the claim over Saba, a place which our Tausug brothers and sisters rightfully claim and assert as our own. Excellent. Now, um, Attorney Santiago, why did the center come out with a statement like this? I mean, people are probably wondering how come is this within, I mean, is this part of your, your is the Saba issue or this kind of thing part of your mandate? Is this part of your, your, your the scope of your activities? How come you guys came out with this uh, statement? Uh, since we're a human rights organization, and uh, I wasn't able to mention earlier that one of our programs actually in ASEAN is uh, developing mechanisms on human rights, uh, we felt that part of the rights of groups actually is the right to self-determination. Although we emphasized in our statement that we do not condone any violence that happened there. We do not condone it. We felt that the claim is actually just, although the means is not, uh, not, not the appropriate means. It's not what is desirable. But it has already happened. Yes. They are already there. And uh, I think that since they have legitimate grievances, and when we talk about uh, Saba, their claim for Saba, it has to be borne out as well that this is not without history. Yeah, yeah. There is a history to this claim. Yes, yes. So it's not as if they are just going there, occupying the land, and just saying, the this is our homeland. Sure, sure. Yes, they, they, uh, they have a grievance. That's why they went there. Sure. So the government there, um, we, we were thinking that the way to deal with it is, by analogy, just like in a hostage-taking situation, crisis, you want to appease them first. You want to appease them, but in this case, 
you're not just appeasing them just for the sake of bringing them back home. You have to make them feel that you recognize their grievance. Yes, yeah. And uh, I'm seeing this with the background that they, the Kirams are actually claiming that they have sent three letters to Malacanang early on yes, yeah. uh, during the time that uh, they the president was new in his position. Yes, yes. But attention, Tiago, we have to pause for a break, but okay. hold, hold that thought because those three letters are very important. We're going to come back to that later when you come back. Uh, we're going uh, to uh, um, come back to that issue. But uh, guys, don't go away because more of uh, human rights and the Sabah issue when Philippines Uncut returns.